Uh, yeah, as Paula mentioned, my name is Blaze Holden. I'm with the company Sustain Natural Fertilizer. And uh, we're a fertilizer manufacturer uh, located in south southeastern Minnesota. Um, the basis for our product is composted turkey litter. And um, as vice president of operations, I'm responsible for the composting operation, uh, the manufacturing plant, and packaging, um, as well as other responsibilities. Uh, so the base product for our material, as I mentioned, is turkey litter, which is the combination of the manure from the turkeys and uh, generally a softwood pine shaving used as bedding. Um, sometimes oat or rice uh, hulls will be used as well. And so our company was uh, comes from the turkey industry. We were turkey farmers originally uh, that uh, began composting turkey litter on the farm uh, as a way to control disease as well as um, to reduce nutrient runoff. Um, that was in the early 80s and uh, from there we started working with the University of Minnesota uh, doing research on agronomical crops and uh, the benefits of composted uh, manures versus ordinary manures. Um, as uh, any of you who have spread manures or compost know, it can be quite challenging um, to apply that material to a field. You're often uh, fighting the weather, um, dealing with wet, uh, wet field conditions in the spring and fall, and um, you have a very narrow window after uh, the ground's thawed before the crops are planted or after the crops uh, come off before the, the ground's thawed. So uh, those challenges um, led us to develop the manufacturing plant. Um, where we uh, uh, make organic fertilizers and um, natural based fertilizers. So the turkey litter uh, is collected from neighboring farms in southern Minnesota. Minnesota is often number one or number two in turkey production, so we have an abundance of uh, turkey litter. We also have very rich soils in our area, and so um, oftentimes uh, there's not the same need for nutrients and, and we're looking to go further away um, with the manures uh, as they've been over applied in some instances. So composting requires uh, three things uh, initially. You need nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen. And so we get the nitrogen from the manure and uh, the carbon comes from the bedding, uh, the, the softwood shavings um, that allows us to compost. So we do uh, aerobic thermophilic composting process, uh, meaning we turn the windrows, we're, we're uh, uh, biodegrading under the presence of oxygen and uh, generating um, high temperatures in the windrows while composting. Uh, it's a year round compost operation. Um, so we bring turkey litter in 12 months a year um, and we bring finished compost out to our plant 12 months a year as well. Uh, we go through a 26-week active composting process, so it's six months per row, uh, and we do that to ensure that the material is fully broken down and stabilized uh, prior to bringing it in to manufacture the fertilizers. It takes about three to four tons of finished compost to make one ton of sustain, and that is because the composting process um, you lose 30% of the mass uh, during composting. And after we bring it into our plant and dehydrate it, we use, lose another 30% of, uh, of the weight um, through water uh, removal. So it, uh, the end result is a very nutrient-dense material, um, very high in NPK, but also in micronutrients um, because of the concentration effect. So after the material has uh, fully stabilized and the temperatures of the uh, windrows have cooled down, we bring it to our manufacturing plant. Uh, the first step in the process at that point is dehydration. We remove the water uh, using a rotary drum dryer. And um, then the material is uh, ground into a powder. It's blended with other nutrient sources and then it's granulated. Um, into uh, small granules or, or particles. Well, we also have uh, 
some finished product blending where we can add other ingredients uh, to the finished fertilizers. And we stream the material down to a consistent particle size, and then we will package it uh, in a variety of different packaging styles. The composting process is uh, really what sets our product apart from um, pelletized manures on the market. Uh, there's a lot of beneficial aspects of composting, agronomic benefits that you achieve during composting, uh, one of which is the conversion of the nitrogen from uh, water-soluble ammoniacal nitrogen to a slow-release organic nitrogen. Uh, so the microorganisms in the windrows uh, consume the nitrogen and the carbon from the bedding, and then they shed that material and bind uh, the nitrogen to the carbon, creating a slow-release nitrogen source. Uh, the composting process also tends to neutralize the pH. Oftentimes, turkey litter will begin with a very high pH because uh, it's, it's very rich in ammoniacal nitrogen, so a lot of ammonium, uh, which, which causes a high pH, and uh, that will reduce through the composting process. Um, as mentioned before, it concentrates nutrients as well. Uh, the carbon, um, the 30% of the, the mass is lost through uh, carbon volatilization. And so uh, the same amount of nutrients that were in the finished, uh, the, the initial material will exist in the finished material. So it's a concentration effect um, uh, through composting. Uh, composting also kills pathogens. So the high temperatures uh, generated in the wind rows uh, render the pathogens ineffective. And so um, we will reach temperatures in the range of 135 to 150 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and maintain those temperatures uh, for many weeks on end and then uh, test the finished product to ensure that uh, pathogens do not exist uh, before we make the, the fertilizer. At the same time, we're also generating beneficial microbiology through composting um, that has many, many good effects uh, on soil health. The high temperatures will also kill weed seeds. So if there are uh, seeds that have survived through the animal or blown into the windrow piles, um, those will be destroyed during composting as well. Uh, following the composting step is the dehydration, and this further concentrates uh, the material, so increasing the nutrient concentration. But it also allows uh, for easier storage, shipping, and handling. Uh, so once the material is dry, it can be and composted. It can be stored indefinitely. There really is no shelf life at that point. Um, and then the removal of uh, the water and the, addition, uh, the concentration of nutrients uh, improves the economics of shipping the material. So we're able to go uh, further away from the initial manure source than might otherwise be um, economically feasible. And the dehydration process also allows for uniform blending and application. Um, so we're able to add in additional nutrients, blend them in a uniform manner, and then apply that material um, uniformly over a field. Uh, we, we go through a blending or a mixing step prior to granulation where we add a variety of different nutrients or soil amending uh, materials to create the different products that we're manufacturing um, and we're able to customize the nutrient ratios of the finished product to meet um, specific crop needs or, um, or uh, to address soil nutrient deficiencies. Um, some of the most common additions that we will add will be uh, different nitrogen sources. So if it's a conventional fertilizer that we're manufacturing, we may add urea or some slow release or stabilized nitrogen. Uh, we also add ammonium sulfate. And then in our organic products, we will use protein-based natural materials such as hydrolyzed feather meal to increase the nitrogen content in the finished product. Uh, we also can add phosphorus, so we will add 
MAP uh, MAP and DAP, or for organic products, we will add bone meals to uh, meet the specific phosphorus ratio we're looking for. Um, for potassium, we use sulfate of potash. That's mined from the Great Salt Lake. Uh, we'll occasionally use murate of potash or uh, KMS, which is uh, potassium magnesium sulfate. Um, one other big advantage of the uh, dehydration and blending is that we can get micronutrients added to uh, the fertilizers in very um, low quantities. So we'll add calcium, sulfur, magnesium, iron, manganese, zinc, and um, boron uh, to address nutrient deficiencies. Um, boron is a common, uh, commonly requested micronutrient, um, and that essentially is because um, there's very little boron in manures to begin with. I believe animals um, are able to absorb the majority of the boron that, that uh, comes with the feed, and so very little is excreted out. And so it's common for a field to be deficient in boron if it's had only manure applications. Um, for some period of time. So the uh, uh, blending of different nutrients results in a variety of different NPK ratios. Our most basic product, which is just dehydrated compost, or we call concentrated compost, is generally a 354 analysis. Um, we also make um, high phosphorus products, so uh, 374 would be an example of a higher phosphorus uh, product that's often used as a starter fertilizer, and that will be made uh, by combining compost with different uh, with uh, bone meals to increase the phosphorus content. Uh, 464 is another example of a higher phosphorus product uh, where we also uh, balance the N to K ratio. Uh, we make a, uh, the highest nitrogen organic product that we make is an 824, so that's 8% organic nitrogen. And we use about 50% hydrolyzed feather meal uh, to achieve that amount of nitrogen. And then uh, also add some sulfate of potash um, to get a 2 to 1 N to K ratio. Uh, the last example on the screen is for what we would call natural based products or hybrid products where we combine uh, synthetic or conventional fertilizers with our composted turkey litter. So we make a 1539 that utilizes UMAX stabilized nitrogen. It's a, a, it's a form of stabilized urea nitrogen. Uh, we also make an 1818. Um, that utilizes a, a sulfur-coated uh, nitrogen. So by blending in conventional fertilizers, it allows us to get to a significantly higher uh, NPK analysis and reduces the um, cost per pound of nitrogen applied. We also do a fair amount of custom formulating. So uh, a grower will come to us with a soil test and uh, we will analyze that soil test and then we can develop a uh, custom formula that will uh, attempt to meet their crop needs without over applying unnecessary nutrients. Um, so this is an example of a typical soil test we may see in Southern Minnesota here. Um, you know, most, most uh, custom fertilizers are either based on a nutrient uh, nitrogen loading application rate or a phosphorus loading application rate, uh, depending on what the, the phosphorus levels are in the soil and uh, what other sources of nitrogen that farmer may have. So we often start by looking at uh, total phosphorus. In this case, at um, 50 ppm, it's quite high or sufficiently high for most crops. And so we would most likely base this application rate on the amount of nitrogen necessary. Um, from there, we'll look at uh, potassium and other micronutrients that may be deficient. In this case, uh, potassium is deficient or, or may be deficient depending on what crop's being grown. Um, it's also low in sulfur, uh, manganese, and boron. 
And so we can take a look at uh, what the crop yield goals are for the grower and what crop they're growing and then come up with a determination on uh, how many pounds of uh, potassium, sulfur, manganese, and boron would need to be applied, and then we would blend those in the necessary ratio uh, so the grower could then apply a single fertilizer that will meet uh, all their crop needs. Or oftentimes, uh, the grower will have their own source of nitrogen, they may have manure from a neighboring field or their, or their own livestock. Um, they may purchase pelletized chicken manure or um, apply conventional nitrogen, in which case they will then use sustained granules to address micronutrient deficiencies. Um, so the next step in the process after we've uh, completed our formulation and blending is uh, the granulation process. So we grind all materials uh, into a powder and then it goes through a granulator where we add water to create a slurry and then roll those, uh, roll that slurry into the small granules uh, and then we dry that uh, amount of water back off to, to have a dry uniform granule. Uh, this is a very important Part of the process because it allows for precision application. Um, many times in a row crop agricultural setting, sustain will be used as a starter fertilizer. So it will be applied uh, either through a drill seeder or a fertilizer box on a planter and be applied in row direct with seed, allowing um, the grower to put uh, the micronutrients needed right with the seed and uh, allows for much lower application rate. So a typical application rate of a sustained starter fertilizer might be around 150 pounds per acre or 200 pounds per acre and is just designed to get that plant started uh, before other uh, forms of nitrogen may be used. We also have uh, capabilities to do blending on the back end after manufacturing. So once we've created a homogeneous granule with the NPK and micronutrient ratio that we were looking for, we can blend in other added ingredients. Um, oftentimes we'll blend in coated fertilizers that have extended release rates. So we can use, for instance, urea nitrogen, uh, a poly-coated urea nitrogen that will have a release rate of 180 days, and we blend that with our base, uh, compost-based granules, um, so they get the synergistic effect of applying compost and organic nutrients along with the long-lasting effects of having extended released fertilizers. We also add different biological products um, such as mycorrhizae, uh, we can do uh, rhizobium or uh, bacillus, streptomyces is another example, um, but we can take a very small uh, quantity of a biological product, often very expensive biological product, and then blend it evenly uh, with our fertilizers so the grower will then get um, good coverage on the field when it's applied um, even though it's at very low rates per acre. Uh, we also blend uh, seed with the fertilizers, um, such as cover crops. Today we were blending um, some red clover with a 374 granule that's going to a wheat grower in Montana. And so he uh, will seed his wheat into a stand of red clover uh, for um, nitrogen credits as well as weed control. And then, of course, the last step in the process is packaging. Now that we have a dry, flowable, stable granule, we are able to put it in a variety of different packaging and uh, make it convenient for use uh, by the farmer or grower. A lot of what we do goes out in commercial 50-pound bags, and then those bags will be you know, dumped into fertilizer hoppers on planters. We also do 2,000-pound bulk tote sacks. Uh, as well as loading bulk trucks out. Um, and then this allows the material to be 
shipped relatively efficiently. So we will ship by semi uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, we, we, we currently sell in all 50 states in the, United, in, in the U.S. We also can ship, uh, can export the material um, in shipping containers. So the composting process ensures a very safe, stable material free of pathogens, which has allowed us to get um, export permits to ship to places like China, Europe, and, and the Middle East.